Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, that's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. We are back, and uh, apologies to our fans for missing the shows, but stuff happens. But we're here to talk about the Breeders' Cup afterwards. Yeah, I, I'm going to echo Matt's apologies. We had a little personal uh, tragedy among our team. Uh, and we're sorry that we weren't here for last week, a, a big week. Hopefully you got to see our written blogs on the Horse Center uh, pages of Horse Racing Nation. But yeah, Matt's right. We are, uh, we are excited to talk about the best and the worst, I guess, the best and the worst from uh, Breeders' Cup 2021, the defining day of the uh, thoroughbred racing season here in America. Matt, I want to start on Friday. There's a lot to talk about from Friday, but let's uh, let's start with the more benign. Unfortunately, there was no Jack Christopher in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, so that made Corniche the favorite. We now have him as the Kentucky Derby, the early winter book favorite for the Kentucky Derby after his win in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Yeah, and it yeah, certainly not only made uh, uh, Corniche the the favorite and the eventual winner, but I think it certainly uh, had a, had a big impact on the pace scenario in the race. And, uh, you know, and, and Corniche won, it was, you know, a typical Bob Baffert trainee kind of performance, got out of the gate smartly, went to the lead, controlled the race on the front end and was a uh, clear cut convincing winner with now a perfect three for three record. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, three for three. Uh, he's going to be the two-year-old champion off two consecutive grade one wins. He was impressive in his five and a half furlong maiden special weight debut at Del Mar as well. So he is the two-year-old champion. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you because uh, I was kind of excited to bet this race and honestly to try to beat the favorites as I so often try to do uh, before the scratch of Jack Christopher because I, I, I thought that uh, created an interesting pace dynamic where both of them wanted to be uh, going out there pretty pretty well early or, or, or at least uh, uh, pressuring that uh, lead on the box stretch. And when Jack Christopher was scratched, I became le far less interested in trying to beat the favorite, now a single singular favorite and, uh, and, and the horse who showed uh, the most speed. It, the, um, it seemed like the best chance to pressure him early might have been from his same barn and uh, of course that did not happen sonic quality road he was a 1.5 million dollar two-year-old in training purchase matt um a legitimate kentucky derby contender but like so many years i'm not convinced we're going to get a kentucky derby winner uh out of this breeders cup juvenile winner i guess street sense did it but uh you'd have to look few and far between from horses who have done that double yeah, for sure. Few and far between. And uh, uh, as the trend has been, there are so many of who of what turn out to be the major contenders in the Kentucky Derby uh, start showing up uh, this month, next month, uh, and, and even into January. And Corniche turned out to be, uh, 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 along with Life is Good, the shortest favorite to win at the Breeders' Cup this past weekend. Yeah, and I think that's interesting as well. We would not have uh, expected that. Was he shorter than Echo Zulu, Matt? Is that is that right? Yes, by about a dime. Yes. Uh, that's surprising. Uh, Echo Zulu, I, I I thought was a uh, more of a sure thing going into the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, Matt, and she uh, she was the star of Friday's races for me. Uh, the daughter of Gun Runner now has three Grade One wins. She's done it at three different tracks, and uh, it was pretty darn easy for Echo Zulu in this juvenile Phillies. Yeah, it was easy, and and I agree with you, Brian. She probably should have been the shortest favorite um, in that uh, in that smallish field, but yeah, she took control of that race uh, right from the get go, and and just made it look easy, Brian. I I didn't think there was any question uh, that she didn't look like a winner. Uh, the entire race she ended up winning by more than five lengths probably could have been more than that uh uh down the stretch and actually ran a faster race uh than corniche did um i think time wise and speed figure wise yeah yeah i thought corniche ran a pretty good race uh in that he was a 
pressured probably a little bit more to get out of the gate from his wider post than Akko Zulu, of course, in the short field. And the difference was uh, marginal. But of course, we're talking about a Philly and we're talking about a Philly who won so easily. So a very impressive uh, win for Echo Zulu as she has done in her maiden race and the spin away and the present and now the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. I saw a lot of people after the race saying, I want to see her run against the males. Uh, she's my Kentucky Derby horse. I'm not ready for that. Uh, and, and I doubt trainer Steve Asmussen and, and Winchell Racing is, but we may be looking at a special filly. Daughter of Gunrunner, Gunrunner certainly got good as the distances got longer later in his career. I, I'm not ready to say that this is a mile and a quarter type of horse yet, but certainly what she's done up until mile 16th has been most impressive, as is the first crop of uh, offspring for her sire, Gunrunner. Yeah, that's for sure. Gunrunner won the, the Breeders' Cup Classic at Del Mar uh, back in 2017. Uh, and yeah, he has just been one of the best freshman sires uh, in a long time. Right, yeah, freshman sire um, like this, it's, it's been a few years at least, Gun Runner, most impressive. It's good to see him with a champion. And of course, Echo Zulu will be a uh, obvious, obvious champion, two-year-old Philly of 2021. All right, Matt, we're gonna come back to Friday a little bit later. Right now, I wanna jump ahead to Saturday. Uh, all along, we've, we've been saying how good is life is good. I mean, because the potential was off the charts. Uh, this is one of the many favorites I tried to beat. And I ended up with egg on my face for trying to beat life is good in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. The son of Into Mischief ran a powerful, powerful race in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, you know, I, I certainly picked life is good in the race. Uh, the odds became too short, uh, 70 cents to the dollar for to really uh, do any particular wagering. I know I had suggested some uh, 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 wagers with life is good that I think ended up uh, coming in, but uh, uh, that was a short price. I was a little concerned. He looked a little bit washy, a little bit wet before the race, but that that uh, that obviously was not a factor. He just overwhelmed uh, the field in the dirt mile and, you know, uh, uh, stamped himself as one of the best three-year-olds in, in, and you wrote about it recently, Brian, on HRN, one of the best three-year-old crops uh, in a long time. Yeah, well, this horse had uh, almost half a year off. He changed barns. He changed coasts from Bob Baffert to Todd Pletcher. Of course, he was back on the West Coast where he began uh, on, on uh, Saturday for the Breeders' Cup race. But uh, yeah, he did not miss a beat in, in, in the layoff and the change of barns and the change of scenery. Life is good is exciting. I tell you what, Matt, um, I was extremely impressed with, with what Nick's go was able to do last year the 2020 mm -hmm. dirt mile because he was pushed into very fast early fractions in that dirt mile uh, last year. And uh, he was able to turn horses away with ease and then just roll at Keeneland in the dirt mile. Uh, it, it was carbon copy for me of what life is good did far different circumstance because Nick Sko was an older horse who had kind of his ups and downs up until then, and he got really good for trainer Brad Cox. Life is good. Also changed barns, but he's five of six lifetime, and his one loss is a terrific, terrific performance at Saratoga. So we still don't know how good life is good, but it reminded me so much of that uh, monster win by Nick Sko last year in the dirt mile, and we all see what happened with Nick Sko as this year went on. Yeah, and, and life is good. Everything, you know, everything about a big victory, uh, a, a big margin, almost six length, a fast time on the clock, 134 and change, and a big speed figure. Yeah, and more than anything for me, Matt, it was, he was pressured going into that first turn. I mean, horses were wanting to go out, so he had to run really fast. You just don't see fractions like that in, in two turn races very often or at least horses who expect to be there at the wire and he was not only there at the wire he was he was just coasting uh one of three wins for Ryder Irat Ortiz Jr uh he was the shoemaker award winner Bill Shoemaker award winner given to the overall point getter at every Breeders Cup 
a, a big weekend for the Ortiz brothers. Irad and William Buick, though, were two, uh, one of two riders to have, were the two riders, I should say, to have three wins at the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, and, and Irad got that award because he just had mounts in way more races uh, than Buick did. Yeah, yeah. William Buick should get some credit because he didn't have many mounts and he still won three. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Joel Rosario won a couple, including a couple big ones, especially the Breeders' Cup Classic. But Jose Ortiz had really, uh, Irad's brother, Jose Ortiz, had a really good Breeders' Cup as well because he was on nothing but long shots, basically. I think uh, Pizza, Pizza uh, Bianca was uh, 9.9 to 1. That was the lowest he had of all these horses he had who finished first and some near misses in, in uh, three other races besides his two wins. Uh, uh, so he was riding long shots and getting it done too. All right, Matt, uh, we've never seen a Japanese winner. And something struck me on, on early on Friday when somebody said, I think it was on Twitter, you, you can throw out all the Japanese horses when they come to America for such a big thing. And I almost said to him, well, yeah, that's true on dirt but not on turf because I was waiting for someone to run on Saturday. Uh, we both liked her. She was my top pick. Love's only you. Uh, what an explosion in mid stretch for this Japanese mare who is a uh, descendant of my friend up there. Sunday silence. Yeah. And Brian, I think we talked about love's only you on one of our shows heading into the breeders cup and pointed out that what made this particular Japanese horse more interesting was that uh, she had some really established f uh, form against really good horses in venues outside of Japan, a big win in Hong Kong, a great run behind uh, one of the best European males uh, in, uh, in Dubai. So this horse, had some outstanding past performances and, and I think was one of the reasons that you and I both liked her. Yeah, and, and it's not just outside of Japan for me because I'm a big believer in Japanese turf racing. Uh, I, I've been a big believer of Japanese turf racing for a long time and I recognize this mare was, was just one of the best turf horses in the country of Japan. Uh, she won the Japanese Oaks a couple of years ago and she clearly was better than ever this year as a five-year-old mare. Uh, running against males. She's now run in four different countries in her last four races. Uh, she's won three big races this year, and she ran well in her two losses this year, but it's just an explosive turn of foot for the granddaughter of Sunday Silence, Matt. And I'm glad on Twitter I did not say, yeah, on dirt you can throw them out, uh, not on turf like I almost did, because uh, just a shocking win in, in my eyes to see a Japanese. They never had a winner. Love's Only You gave them their first winner. But soon after, Japan got their second winner, and it was March Lorraine in, in the Breeders' Cup Distaff, which I think was kind of a strange race from the, the very beginning of the race. Yeah, that's for sure. This certainly is a victory that uh, I would describe as situational, um, the, the, that the Distaff just was run uh, with with crazy early fractions um and and as we saw it took a toll on the big favorite latruska in there march lorraine was uh was just 10 cents shy of being 50 to 1 in the race um in the early going she was ninth more than 10 lengths behind and, and got the got the perfect setup launched a big rally from the outside and then and then held on gamely to get the win yeah you know, you know she had good form over in japan on dirt uh since she switched to dirt many many starts ago i i just didn't trust it and i saw a couple performances there maybe uh one or two against males that weren't all that good and i just didn't think she could run with the females you're right though the the, the race really changed uh quickly when those crazy early fractions you, you I, I said it about life is good a little bit but even more so about a nine furlong race where where they're running that ridiculously fast and contested in the first quarter and, and the first half mile there and even even the first six furlongs there which really took latruska out of her race probably took she dares the devil out of the race two of the horses to beat uh i feel bad that latruska 
had such a marvelous year and then ran uh, pretty much up the track in the stretch in this Breeders' Cup distaff. But uh, uh, she'll still be a champion, even though she, I guess she dares the devil finished ahead of her in two out of the three meetings they had. But it's got to be Latruska, who's the older mare, older female champion. March Lorraine, um, yeah, I, I'm happy for the Japanese. They, they support uh, racing uh, more than just about any other country in the world. So it's good uh, for them to see breakthrough. I thought it would happen on turf, and I guess it did happen on turf with Love's Only You, but then it came back with a shocking result on the dirt a few races later. Hey man, uh, Matt, when I was up in Chicago all those years, uh, the big trainer up there in many of those years was Wayne Catalano. And I, I don't think many trainers have four Breeders' Cup winners now in his career as quietly as the Catman does. Wayne Catalano struck again with a fourth Breeders' Cup winner uh, over his career. And this was Aloha West. I'm mad at myself because I finally convinced myself that Jackie's Warrior was not going to lose this race. Aloha West would have been my long shot, but I just singled Jackie's Warrior on my tickets because I thought he was too good. He wasn't. And Aloha West was the winner. Yeah, Jackie's Warrior just was not, you know, was just not too good. He just not was not particularly good at all in the uh, in the Breeders' Cup sprint, that happens, you know. Uh, uh, the, Jackie's Warriors still has had a terrific, uh, fantastic uh, campaign and career thus far. But uh, Aloha West for the Catman, for a former rider, um, a trainer who, you know, after the race, you saw him talking about how uh, um, he doesn't have many horses left uh, at this point. And one of those. Uh, very, very good trainers who just uh, has trouble competing against the really big barns, uh, certainly the big names, but even against really big barns uh, of, of some trainers in uh, in the Chicago area also. But uh, another one uh, was was pretty far behind and came running wide around the turn um, at 11 to 1. Yeah, and if you've been following Aloha West, you know he, he, he was literally a jump or two short from winning a pretty big sprint, the Phoenix Stakes at Keeneland uh, against Special Reserve in the start before. Now, this was Aloha West's first stakes win. Uh, I don't think he can be champion with those credentials, only having one stakes win, but you could see it building. He, he, he ran two very big allowance races at Saratoga. And the son of Hardspun, who was unraced at both two and three, didn't race until his four-year-old season, has now won five of nine races and is uh, deserving of mention among the best sprinters in the country. I thought he was rather unlucky not to win at Keeneland, and uh, now he, he won the much bigger race in the Breeders' Cup. Um, as far as Jackie's Warrior, I thought the pace was, was tough. It, it, it was very contested on fast fractions again. But it just wasn't the Jackie's Warrior. You could see it early on, even when he was on the lead, that he was just not quite the same horse as usual. And it, it's it's uh, it, it's kind of tough for him that he's had two disappointing Breeders' Cup races in back-to-back -back years after doing so much the rest of the year. So much that I think he still has a great shot to be Sprinter of the Year. Uh, Dr. Scheibel makes a good case, though, Matt. Uh, if I had to pick one horse out of the whole Breeders' Cup who was – too good to lose, it might be Dr. Scheibel because he ran a really good race again. And, and that's uh, pretty much what we've seen all along out, out of this California three-year-old. Yeah, certainly can't argue with you, with you there, Brian. Uh, um, he was one of the West Coast horses on the dirt that, you know, that showed up. Now, do you have an early pick for sprinter of the year and now that things got interesting here? Oh, I don't know. It, it uh, like you said, Brian, with uh, with Jackie's Warrior, um, uh, yeah, he disappointed in this race. But outside of his dominance, you know, there were horses here and there that got some pretty nice wins. But but nobody else really put together, uh, uh, you know, uh, enough wins. I don't know. It might be hard for Jackie's Warrior not to end up with the title. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But I can see a lot of people jumping on the Dr. Scheibel bandwagon because he, his four races this year were super uh, unlucky to lose there. And by the way, Jose, Jose Ortiz, who I mentioned, had uh, really nice performances with a bunch of long shots. He wrote 
Aloha West to this win at, uh, I believe it was 11 to one. Yep. All right, Matt, I mentioned that we were going to go back to Friday a little bit and we, we got to talk about Charlie Appleby. We've talked about the riders here. Charlie Appleby was the dominant trainer of this Breeders' Cup. Um, not a complete surprise, as good a year as he's had all over the globe this year, uh, training the Godolphin horses. Uh, William Buick was aboard all three of his winners. And uh, I, I, I was really happy to see at least one of those three winners. But let's go back to Friday because uh, one of his three winners didn't pay off to the betters. And, and it's a big deal, folks. Uh, Matt and I need to talk about the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf and everything that went on. Both of us had the Appleby horses picked as our top two picks, Albar and Modern Games. And of course, Albar had an unfortunate incident before the start of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf where he flipped in the starting gate. Thankfully, him and Frankie Dettori were okay uh, after the uh, scary incident and that horse needed to be scratched. But uh, as it turns out, his stablemate, who was one to his inside on the rail, modern games the post-time favorite or, or the uh, uh going to be the post-time favorite should not have been scratched Matt. yeah and and uh, it, it was a strange circumstance of of uh, what went on in that particular uh pre-race pre-race mess with uh modern games being let out of his stall and I understand why he was because Albar was on the ground and he was flailing his legs and and uh, uh, the the two horses on either side of him were in danger of getting kicked and hurt in there. So I understand why that was done. I, I, I don't have a great deal of fault with that being done, but but a lot of things that were said, they, they, they the, the initial vet report said that modern games uh reared up and banged his head and and i've seen other very reputable uh reports saying that that just did not happen at all um and then uh he was scratched he was taken out of the pools the betting pools apparently he was put back in the betting pools i didn't know you could do that even brian but he was put back in the betting pools. There are pictures of the race finally having started and, and modern games was still in the betting pools at that point. Um, aside from the fact that uh, he ended up running for not purse money. And personally, you know, uh, I was somebody that had bets on modern games. I had two day wagers in daily doubles that would have ended up uh, uh, winning um, and got nothing out of it. Um, you know, I saw an interesting quote that said, uh, you know, that this particular uh, uh, incident and what went on, you know, uh, racing turned uh, winners into losers and losers into winners. Yeah, it's another black eye for racing. Let's let's call it what it is here, because it was, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm even hearing different reports. I don't completely trust uh, anymore what the CHRB is, is saying because we, we don't know exactly what happened. If it was, if it was an overzealous vet saying, okay, we're going to scratch this horse because he broke through the gate and there are issues with him. That's one thing, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't trust that. I don't trust the information uh, coming out of the CHRB, the California Horse Racing Board out there. And it, it just seems like uh, there were mistakes made, both maybe veterinarian mistakes, but also steward mistakes. The horse shouldn't have been scratched. Like you said, he went back and forth in and out of the, uh, the betting pool. Um, I'm with you. I had modern games in, in, in wagers going forward. And I, I don't think we, we're, the, uh, uh, we're the ones who really suffered. We got a refund on that money. In fact, I was, I was rather lucky because hit it, hit it a bomb uh, or tis the bomb. I keep saying hit it a bomb. Tis the bomb was my one throw in besides the Appleby horses and the two day wagers. So I actually got more money that way. Uh, but for all those people who had multi race wagers, going and i would have been one of them if i had thrown pizza bianca in all those people who had multi-race wagers going uh forward to modern games that or or albar um you you really got you really got screwed because uh if you like those horses you're probably not going to like the uh the american who ended up the post on favorite dakota gold and uh yeah. for my yeah for modern games to uh 
be scratched for really no good reason and then be allowed to run for purse money only. It, it, just just a terrible circumstance. So I feel for all those betters who who had that and were forced to be on Dakota Gold and then and then lost out on an obvious win because Modern Games was most impressive. So a terrible situation. Another black eye for racing. And um, I don't have much more to say about it, Matt. But Charlie Appleby had that situation happen. Then he had a similar situation where Master of the Seas acted up before the Breeders' Cup Mile on Saturday. Uh, luckily, his other entrant wasn't scratched because Master of the Seas was my, lo my long shot in the race, and his other entrance was Space Blues, and Space Blues, your top pick, Matt, was, uh, was dominant. Uh, he got to run for Charlie Appleby. So these first two races for Appleby, uh, two really good horses in both races. One got scratched uh, from the juvenile turf. One got scratched from the mile. One got... Uh, uh, scratched for the betters from the juvenile turf and ended up winning easily. And then Space Blues dominated in the mile. Yeah, let me say a little bit more about uh, Charlie Appleby and, and his weekend at the Breeders' Cup. He had, Brian, he had six horses entered in various Breeders' Cup races. Two of them were scratched. Four of them ran. Three of them won. I mean, wow. I mean, what a performance. And I also saw a stat that, you know, uh, this year he has uh, sent 18 horses over to America or, or and or North America, and nine of them have been winners. I don't know, Brian, it got to be pretty easy, uh, I guess, uh, in some of these turf races to just say, hey, I'm betting Charlie Appleby. I, I, I sort of lucked out in doing that because when um, domestic spending was scratched out of the Breeders' Cup turf, I needed a horse to substitute in to some of my wagers. And I said, I'm going with Charlie Appleby. And I put your beer into my wagers and your beer turned out to be the third winner for Charlie Appleby in the Breeders' Cup turf at Eight and a half to one. Yeah, a beer, uh, a beer was my saving grace. Uh, I had a beer on every ticket, so I, I cashed a lot. And that, that was the only race I cashed. I'm always looking for something a, a little bit bigger than uh, a small hit in these races. But a beer was my top pick for a while now. And uh, I just thought he was a three-year-old who was getting better and better with every start. As far as Char Charlie Appleby, he's done it all year long. He's done it for years now, but he's uh, really had a fantastic year. And uh, uh, obviously he was a threat in all these. He could have brought over a bunch of other horses who there was a few that uh, I thought would have been certain contenders in Breeders' Cup races, but he brought these six and uh, you know, three, three out of four and two were scratched. Amazing. I beer, uh, the way he finished was uh, something special. And, and I saw that in Belmont and I saw that over in England in his last, last race over there. He, he doesn't want a wet turf, but uh, give him a firm turf and, and the development that he's made in Ibeer is, uh, I think he's the best grass horse in the world now. And he showed that he got to show it on Breeders' Cup Day. So I was happy. A son of Dubawi one of the best sires in the in the world, if uh, if not the very best, for sure, right up there. All right, Matt, uh, we, we got to talk about the Breeders' Cup Classic. We haven't even touched on the Classic yet. That was the, that, it was the big race. I mean, I, there were, there are four horses in here who had a shot at Horse of the Year, I think, with a win, uh, and they were four obvious favorites. They ran one, two, three, four. I managed to bet them in reverse order, four, three, two, one, go figure. Uh, I was hoping that uh, I think part of my betting in the classic was uh, sentimental with Hot Rod Charlie. I thought he would run a good race and he did run a good race. All three three year olds, uh, uh, Medina Spirit, of course, and Essential Quality all ran very good races in the Breeders' Cup Classic. But uh, uh, I'm not sure when the race was over, but it seemed like the race was over pretty quick with Nick's go getting a relatively he had to go fast to do it but it was a relatively unpressed fast. And, and when that happens in a two-turn race, you just can't beat Nixco. Yeah, and that first quarter was 20, 23 and change, 23.16, I think. And, and, and relatively quickly, Nixco got up by a length and, and 
for people that may have had a doubt about whether Nick's go was going to get the 10 furlong distance, which he was trying for the first time. I think those doubts were predicated on the fact that they expected that Nick's go was going to have to go faster than he did and that he was going to have pressure, more pressure than he did. Horses running up on his flank, either side, maybe both sides. And that just didn't happen. And as we've seen time after time, I know, we hadn't seen it at 10 furlongs before, but we've seen time after time that when Nick Sko can get out to the lead, clear, he can just keep going and going and going. And he did it again at over three to one, Brian. A lot of us expected him to be a much shorter price than that. Uh, certainly hindsight is uh, uh, is 2020, but uh, wow, at, at that kind of price on Nick Sko. That was something. Yeah, yeah. I, I I had him as my horse to beat in our horses to beat show a few weeks ago because I thought he was a real danger of doing this. Um, I will argue with you a little bit that, you know, he ran 45 and change in this race. So that second quarter was really fast. And that's, uh, you know, basically uh, keeping that lead. So 45 and change, you don't see a lot of 45 and changes in a mile and a quarter race. So Nick's go... Uh, uh, did what he needed to do to do what he wants to do. And, and that is uh, get some breathing room out on the lead. And once he did, I, I just never felt like they were going to get him. And sure enough, they never did. Um, you know, this is, this has been a really nice horse. He, he ran some good races as a two-year-old. Uh, then he kind of fell off for whatever reason for, for trainer Ben Colbrook uh, uh, early in his career, but he ended up winning 10 out of 24 races so far. We might see him a little bit more before he goes off to stud next year, uh, 10 of 24, but, but for Brad Cox, he was eight of 10 with uh, eight pretty easy wins, eight convincing wins, uh, some big races, starting with the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile last year. Pegasus World Cup in January. Hey, he was the best at the start of the year. Yep. He's the best at the end of the year. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that this wins in the Pegasus World Cup and the Whitney and the Breeders' Cup Classic and, and decisive wins uh, certainly earned him the Horse of the Year title, man. Yeah, without question. We don't, we, we don't get to say that very much anymore, that... Uh, the horse that won the biggest race of the year to start the year in January also won the biggest race of the year in November. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and it, it, it does make me think of Painter a little bit. Uh, Painter, a great story, of course, um, uh, years ago, who was a top three-year-old. I think he ran second in the Belmont, and then he won the Haskell. It's right after the Haskell, he came down with uh, colitis and then laminitis, and it sure looked like he would not survive he won an extended battle and a survival for his life. And he actually came back and raced as a four-year-old. Uh, he, he might not have set the world on fire yet as a sire, but uh, he's the sire of Nick's go, the, the 2021. Uh, I'll announce it now, the 2021 Horse of the Year, Matt. I think this also opens the question. I thought Essential Quality was definitely the leader of, among the three-year-old males, the glamour division in racing. Uh, for the Eclipse Award. But this does raise a question with the performance of Life is Good in the Dirt Mile, uh, the fact that Medina Spirit finished ahead of Essential Quality, maybe it wasn't exactly a, um, uh, an important second in, in that I think they were both loser, losers to Nick's go and, and Medina Spirit kind of finished a little bit better than Essential Quality and Hot Rod Charlie, but he finished ahead of Essential Quality and both times they met. Life is Good course finished ahead of Medina Spirit both times they met uh Hot Rod Charlie super nice three-year-old but he has no chance in this award it comes down to essential quality Medina Spirit and life is good and, and I'm not sure who's going to win the three-year-old championship I'm not either Brian and I think those three that you mentioned at the end there are will be the finalists uh in the voting and, and not only did life is good uh 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 beat Medina Spirit twice. He did them in victories, um, you know, uh, also. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you start comparing head to heads, I don't know if that clarifies things because of what, uh, because of what life is good did. And, and, you know, and you do see people saying there, there's the, the, there are the issues with trainer Bob Baffert and you do see people saying, um, uh, uh, well, well, don't blame the horse. Don't penalize the horse because of 
of the issues that are surrounding Bob Baffert. I said, well, okay, but I, I don't know if it's that simple. And looking at the week's uh, NTRA poll that came out after the Breeders' Cup and a number of the votes, a significant number of the voters in that pool are also voters uh, for the Eclipse Award. Um, uh, essential quality was, was voted ahead of, was ranked ahead of Medina Spirit. I don't know what that's worth. I don't know if that's an indicator of what's going to happen in the uh, Eclipse voting, but uh, it'll be interesting for sure. Yeah, interesting for sure. My, I, I still would favor essential quality with his five uh, graded stakes wins this year. Life is good. That's his only grade one win of the year. So uh, I, I think it might come down to essential quality Medina Spirit. We don't know if Medina Spirit is the official winner of the Kentucky Derby yet, Matt. So uh, who knows? Can I get a parting shot from you on our Breeders' Cup wrap up show, sir? Take a little breath there. We uh, got a lot. Uh, we got a lot in there for sure. Um, yeah, the Breeders. It was a interesting Breeders' Cup. I hope you fans uh, 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 had some successful wagers. I think Brian and I gave you some decent picks uh, if you read our stuff. And of course, uh, I want to thank everybody for watching the show. And I want to say welcome back to our producer Ben Wilkie. And thanks for putting together the show, Ben. Yeah, and, and thanks to Ben, uh, and thanks to you, my golden pal, Matt Shipman. Oh, golden pal, what a race he <laughs> ran, especially out of the starting gate. Uh, hey, folks, subscribe, turn on those notifications so you never miss another episode of Horse Center. We sure do appreciate it. We appreciate our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. And most of all, we appreciate you tuning in to Horse Center every week. We'll be back next week with another great edition of Horse Center. We'll see you then. <laughs>